Here in Central Asia, where magnificent mountain ranges meet the Great Steppe, for more than 70 years, Kazakhstan was hidden within the largely closed Soviet Union. With the collapse of the USSR in the early 90s, the country declared independence and started opening up to the world. Conventional wisdom always assumed that the vast wilderness of the Great Steppe was of no great historical interest, that it had only been inhabited by a few primitive nomadic tribes and served as little more than a thoroughfare for merchants and travelers who journeyed along the ancient Silk Road that linked the recognized civilizations of East and West. Kazakhstan's recent history is a story of economic growth and rapid development but recent discoveries are now forcing Western academics to look at the region with renewed interest. Archaeological finds include burial sites dating back more than 2,000 years and laden with elaborate and decorative artifacts in precious metals, like this spectacular golden suit, a replica produced using exact copies of the gold embellishments discovered in an ancient tomb. The level of sophistication and artistry suggests advanced infrastructure, developed skills, and a highly educated society with a well-organized hierarchy, certainly not a group of primitive nomads. The territory of Kazakhstan is in the center of the Eurasian region, and a great many migration and cultural events have taken place here, on this land, from west and east, and from east to west. That's why they have all left very material impressions of different cultural and historical phenomena. Certain regions of Kazakhstan, depending on the climatic conditions of this huge country, were inhabited mostly by nomadic cattle breeders. Yet alongside the mountains, Tian Shan, Altai and Tarbargatai, the economy was consistently settled. Kazakhstan's architecture is quite peculiar because there are two types present in our region. Stationary architecture, with its objects made of stone, brick, clay, and mobile architecture, with the yurt still representing nomadic dwelling to this day. While in the Middle Ages and even earlier, that role was played by wagons drawn by bulls, horses, and sometimes camels. Over the centuries, various cultural influences came and went, often leaving traces that became ingrained in the national consciousness as myth and legend. Near the Kazakh city of Taras, two spectacular mausoleums have become steeped in their own unique and fascinating legends. There were two extremely important iconic figures, one could call them, uh, around the 11th, 12th centuries in uh, what is today southern uh, Kazakhstan. One was Hoja Ahmed Yasawi, and uh, the other was Aisha Bibi, a woman. The monuments to Hoja Ahmed Yasawi and Aisha Bibi, they're mainly connected with Islam, that is, with religion. Part of our history is Scythian, there's the golden man, we have Beryl, what's called Paziric culture. That's all related to the Scythian period. Beric Abdigaluli leads the research organization Sacral Kazakhstan. He and his team are engaged in an ambitious project to catalogue the country's folk stories and monuments that reflect its rich heritage. One of the tasks of our Sacral Kazakhstan project is to unite the, the history of Kazakhstan from the ancient times to the present. Therefore, it's a cultural, a socio-cultural project, while by the term sacral, we don't necessarily mean holy or divine. Sacral means objects that play a significant role in the lives of the people and the state. Hoja Ahmed is famous as the founder of a Sufi order. He was a great mystic, uh, wrote wonderful poetry, so he was very influential in the development of Islam 
in that region through his uh, Sufi uh, teachings. Aisha Bibi. Aisha Bibi is a beautiful story about a tragic love and as of today, as recently, especially after the fall of communist ideology, people have begun to restore the legend. Uh, there are many myths around her and around her shrine. Um, the shrine is supposedly uh, built as a love uh, token to this uh, princess who died very young. Aisha Bibi is an extraordinary figure uh, in contrast to uh, Khoja Ahmad Yasawi, who is very much a part of the established religion, although the mystical side of religion. The mausoleum was very unique and tender. In fact, there has been an attempt at reconstruction. The places where people were buried, we Kazakhs have always associated them with other worlds. We have always been sacral. So it's not the orthodox teaching of Islam, it is the mystical tradition, but nevertheless it has very solid roots, whereas Aisha Bibi is more of a folk uh, religious cult. As an architect, Almas Ardabayev has devoted his professional life to the study and restoration of culturally important historical buildings throughout Central Asia. So, to some degree, such beauty of the monument to Aisha Bibi proclaims the purity, beauty and wonderful spiritual and physical qualities of the interred. Besides that, it tells us that such wonderful subjects do indeed go to heaven. I'd like to mention my own personal theory about the story behind Aisha Bibi's memorial. If you think of the place where the mausoleum was built, near the Talas River, and in the year 751 AD, an important battle took place near the region. In the battle, Chinese troops from the east that always targeted the area clashed with Muslim troops from the west and the southwest who joined forces with the Turkic tribes. It was a decisive battle, and it resulted in any Chinese claims to those lands ending for good, well, for thousands of years and to this day. They suffered a terrible defeat at the hands of the combined Islamic and Turkic troops. And so, the most dangerous and important milestone for the Islamic world at the time was embodied in this so very beautiful, bright and spectacular mausoleum for Aisha Bibi. But that's just my own personal theory. She was supposedly the daughter of a Karakhani, one of the local um, uh, dynasties, or the daughter of this uh, dynasty and she died um, and was greatly loved and revered by all who knew her. Almost everyone in Kazakhstan has a different story to tell about Aisha Bibi and her demise. Details of the folktale vary from one telling to the next. Some say she was banished by an angry father, others that she married in secret and eloped, or that she had run away from home to be with a forbidden lover. Despite the many different versions of the story, each one shares a common essence, that she embarked on a romantic journey that ended badly. Aisha Bibi wasn't supposed to, but she still left in pursuit of her beloved to the city of Taraz. On the way, when she arrived, well, it's, it's a well-known legend. She died from a snake bite in the arms of her beloved. Aisha Bibi represents the popular uh, culture of the time and a popular culture which has survived. So over the centuries, women have come to pray at her tomb, uh, to ask for protection, to ward off, uh, that she might ward off evil and so on, give them blessings. Her shrine is seen as a, a monument to love for this lost, to this um, young girl who died. Um, but whether it's true or not, of course, we don't know. So here we get a cult uh, developing around this um, individual, and it's particularly um, a female cult. Uh, she died young, she was supposedly very beautiful. So over the centuries, women have gone to pray at the shrine to leave little gifts.
places where famous people are buried, it is always in our minds, considered to have powerful energy. If you ask for anything in this exact place... Wanting a child, wanting to be cured of various ailments, women from all over the region uh, and through the ages would go to her shrine to pray for protection, for um, help, to have children, to bring back straying husbands. So in a very different way, she belongs to popular uh, religion, whereas uh, Ahmed uh, Yasavi belongs to a more learned tradition of Islam, but a mystical learned tradition. And also, because Taraz is situated there on the Silk Roads, all the legends from all over the East came together. And, uh, for example, the legend of Taj Mahal, uh, that uh, the great uh, monument that Shah Jahan built to his favorite wife. So the shrine to Aisha Bibi was seen through that prism and was thought that it must have been built by someone who loved her. Um, and she died before uh, she was able to marry him. But it is a shrine to love. And so whether or not that is the truth, that is how it's come to be remembered. Whether it was a grieving and guilt-ridden father or a bereaved husband or lover who built the mausoleum will almost certainly never be known for sure. But no one in Kazakhstan doubts that the glorious building stands as an enduring symbol of love for an extraordinary young woman. The mausoleum belongs to one of the powerful people, perhaps it was even a woman, from the ruling Karakhanid family of a Turkic dynasty. He loved her so very much, and within this monument, each piece of stone is unique. And both the architect who authored the idea of this decor and his fellows, ceramists, who actually made this remarkable terracotta lining, they were real poets. From the remaining elements of the mausoleum decor at the top, in the upper part of the portal of the mausoleum, some fragments of the inscription have been preserved. It reads, sky, autumn, Clouds. Nature is beautiful. And then again, if you look at the monument, well, if you have an idea of the historical situation which led to the building of the mausoleum, then you can say this. So it glorifies the one who passed away and promises that eternal, wonderful future in the afterworld. The monument to Aisha Bibi is located exactly in a region of ancient oasis with a predominantly nomadic lifestyle. The steppe nomads constantly used to visit it. I would say that Aisha Bibi's architecture is that of a developed agricultural civilization which has long had very close ties with Iran, Central Asia, Mavaranakh, that is today's Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and so on. This is in fact our own small Taj Mahal of the steppe, a memorial to a beloved who died. Even today, this level of construction and detail would be quite an architectural and engineering feat. How would modern day builders manage? As an architect who has devoted a few years of my life to reconstructing medieval mausoleums, I can say that, in theory, anything can be done nowadays. However, there is always the question of price, that's one thing. And then another is that it's getting ever more difficult to find good professionals who could do it well, but also who'd put their souls into it. Starting from around the 7th to 8th centuries, this type of architecture was closely linked to Islamic traditions and views. The fact is that that whole decorative cladding of Aisha Bibi was made by hand. There were no stamps. Every stone was cut out anew. That was what brought life, vitality and this real warm human beauty to it. And in Islam, the afterlife, which is what the mausoleum portrays, 
promises heaven to the person who is interred, if he lived as a perfect human being, as a real Muslim, that is. Идеальным человеком, который вел себя как истый мусульманин, ему обещан рай. Almost every legend in the world can be traced back to at least a grain of truth. In Aisha Bibi's case, all we can know for sure is that more than a thousand years ago, a young woman died before her time, and that grief in love inspired a magnificent memorial. The legends surrounding Hoja Ahmed Yasawi, though, are very different. He was famous in the region even during his own lifetime. He's a well-known local hero, and his teachings have been preserved to this day. Well, as a person who believes in facts and written sources, I could say that the legend of Aisha Bibi is certainly very beautiful. But the legends about Khudja Ahmed Hisawi, which are based on many realities, are certainly more truthful and even greater. Основывается на многих реалиях, конечно, она более и правдивая, и более великая. Ахмед Ясави today is seen as a great Sufi teacher, and from him descended a main, but also offshoots of the main line of Sufi thought transmission. And there are followers of his particular spiritual exercises all over the world, particularly, of course, in Turkey, in the Turkic world, uh, but elsewhere too, because it's not just a set of beliefs, it's also a set of uh, spiritual and physical exercises designed to bring you into a state of commun communion with God. Um, and so uh, it is a way of behaving and a way of achieving that unity with God, and that remains uh, very important to believers. Tamerlane's court chronicler, Shlafadin Yezdi, in his chronicle, Safanama, or Book of Victories, directly shows that Tamerlane himself set the basic dimensions of the structure, along with certain main points of its decoration. That is, Tamerlane himself, his participation, wasn't just, so to speak, in giving the order, but indeed, he had a hand in the design too. That has been documented. Islam was first introduced uh, into Central Asia by the Arabs in about uh, end of the 7th century AD, early 8th century. And it spread amongst the settled populations, partly by the sword, but partly also um, by the power of um, uh, what was perceived as a superior culture, a superior level of uh, learning. So Baghdad, uh, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, was a magnet uh, for Muslims from all over, um, the, as they would see it, the civilized world of their day. So the southern part of uh, Central Asia was attracted to this very orthodox, very learned style of Islam. <laughs> Hodja Ahmed Yasawi's mausoleum, it's really right to say that it isn't a mausoleum. It's a whole complex of very diverse rooms. There was also a mosque, a library, palace rooms, places where food was prepared for believers, places for meetings, and so on. Yasawi was on the edge of the nomad world. He himself is often depicted as an itinerant uh, mystic preacher, teacher. And so he was able to communicate with people from the nomad tradition in a language using a symbolism that was accessible to them. It's widely believed that if a Muslim visits Hodja Ahmed's mausoleum three times, he can count that as a visit to Mecca. Yes, we will say, but this is historical fact but it's only part of the historical fact. We have cr created our own narratives. It's a bit like a television program, where you take what you need for the moment, and the rest um, is simply irrelevant for that particular purpose. And the place where Hodja Ahmed Yasawi was buried is a small mausoleum built in the 19th century. He was not seen as something completely alien and divorced from um, pagan cults from shamanistic, um, animistic cults. Uh, he could absorb that 
uh, into his belief system, his Islamic belief system, because it was a mystical belief system, uh, wasn't formed by strict uh, orthodox canons. So as a more complex structure, it has details and more complex solutions that make it more significant in scale, in its influence on designs, on compositional solutions, and so on. More than two centuries after the old mausoleum was significantly rebuilt, expanded, and probably reconstructed by a famous conqueror of the universe, as they called him in Central Asia. The prominent popularity of Turkestan and of this tomb, or to name it properly, the complex where Hodja Ahmed Yusawi was buried, is linked to the fact that not only is a great saint laid there, but also that the complex was built by Tamerlane. And it's wonderful, one of the greatest monuments of Central Asian medieval architecture. Why did Tamerlane pay attention to that tomb? Firstly, Hodja Ahmed Yusawi was his spiritual patron. All his biggest events, starting a war, a crusade, a marriage and so on, would always start with him visiting Hodja Ahmed Yusawi's tomb in order to ask for his blessing. But as a whole solution and an integral solution, both in terms of color and architecture, Aisha Bibi's mausoleum is certainly simpler, more understandable and accessible to everyone. The fact that these people existed gives us some sort of justification. We don't know uh, the reality of who they were or what they were. We have created narratives around them, and those narratives reflect our hopes and fears, our vehicles through which to express our anger, our disgust, or our admiration, our hope. Even after more than a thousand years, though the lines between legend and factual history may always remain at least a little blurred, these two very different but significant historical figures continue to play an important role in modern Kazakhstan.